Welcome, everybody. I am just going to be brief, and then I'll open it up to our panelists so you can see and hear some, some great stuff. Uh, it's been wonderful to witness uh, the Challenging Punishment Conference um, in terms of how it brings together a variety of voices on issues so crucial to our communities and country. Um, and just to quote some of the materials in its discussion of the relevant social, legal, and public health issues raised by the war on drugs and mass incarceration, also reflecting uh, the great uh, legacy of Columbia's Institute for Research in African American Studies and its late founder, Manning Marable, and the idea of sharing ideas not only among academics, but again, with a larger community and making these um, panels free to the public, so it's wonderful to have that as a legacy, but also to keep it going into the future. Um, I'm honored to be part of this conference, and I uh, thanks to Professor Roberts uh, for soliciting the participation of artists and cultural workers, and for understanding how we too are a part of this discussion. Um, it's great to be here at the Schomburg. Uh, because, of course, uh, Arturo Schomburg, when he started this collection many, many years ago, almost a century ago, um, he brought together literature, history, and art in community engagement. Art was always a part of the Schomburg Center. Um, so it's always wonderful to remember how he saw that confluence. Um, our topic today is the arts and cultural production confronting mass incarceration and the war on drugs. You've heard about our wonderful panelists. And um, we'll go in the order, uh, Lee Quinones, then Jamel Shabazz. No, I'm sorry, Lee Quinones, then Hank uh, Willis Thomas, Jamel Shabazz, and Lemon Anderson. Uh, so um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here. Uh, Kelly and Megan and Columbia and distinguished guests, um, you know, personalities, good friends, new friends, and uh, all of y'all. Um, yeah, my name is Lee Quinones. I'm a painter living here in New York, Brooklyn, New York, actually. And um, I'm going to show you a few images of uh, my work stemming from the early 70s, uh, where I got my first unorthodox start on the subways. Uh, like many other of my peers, and uh, leading into fine painting and uh, mural um, uh, painting, and most of it revolving around what I was witnessing on the streets and in other family structures and, uh, you know, the city itself. Um, so I'll, I'll start from the other side. Does this work? Okay. So this is, um, um, well, not to get into the whole technical thing, but this is what they call a whole car subway painting. Um, I did many of these, over 100 or so of these cars, and uh, this was one of a double whole car married couple, which was two train wagons that are never separated. They're connected by a steel beam in the middle instead of a coupler, so those trains never get, uh, you know, disengaged from each other. And uh, I used that as a platform for um, a mural that I thought that was, um, you know, that basically reflected what I was seeing on the streets, what I was hearing on the streets, um, and also hearing in school and, uh, and in my family. So some of it may be sarcastic, some of it is very dramatic and straight to the point. But it was actually affectionately called Jesus Christ Superstar. And um, this was the second car out of the, uh, the double hole car. Um, this is the first car of that. So as you can see, it's connected to the next car. Um, this, uh, this, this, this type of painting, uh, it brought a whole new style of painting in that movement because every, you know, as everyone knows, everyone there is narcissistically involved with each, each other. They're just like into the name calling and name placement and painting. I was more about like the aesthetics around the name and uh, the issues revolving around that. So 
uh, that's uh, so these these two cards right here pretty much started a whole new uh, thinking in the movement itself. Um, this is a handball wall mural that I was actually going to do, uh, execute with uh, Keith Haring. Um, unfortunately, during that time, he was uh, very ill um, from HIV, uh, and uh, we were supposed to collaborate on this piece together. Uh, this is down in my neighborhood. Uh, it's affectionately called The Golden Child. Uh, and it was something that I, I felt that it, it needed to be like sort of a neighborhood prescription um, because it was myself speaking to um, my friends, my peers, um, just people in the neighborhood about like that you can be um, so much bigger than the, the infiltration of drugs in the, in the, in the city and even just uh, remorselessness, you know. So um, I, I ended up doing the painting on my own because at that point he was just uh, really ill and he couldn't participate, unfortunately. But I used uh, the imagery of the kids uh, that have kind of molded down below the, the kid on the bike is uh, it's sort of in homage of his uh, radiant child that he was uh, very famous, so famous for. This is uh, a painting on canvas in 1984, A Life Takes a Life, uh, my witnessing of a life being taken by another life. Uh, many things that I saw in my neighborhood in the Lower East Side, Chinatown area. So. Um, this was a result of that. Um, of course, born in 1960 in Ponce, Puerto Rico, raised in the Lower East Side. I was very much aware, as many of you are, of the whole conflict in Southeast Asia and uh, the, uh, the effects of it on people of all color, and uh, particularly just uh, people that came from poverty, uh, underprivileged um, backgrounds that were put into that mess uh, chaotic mess, um, and this was like my sarcastic way of like just showcasing someone, a soldier, just uh, being with himself in the bush, picking his nose between a firefight, and wondering whether, you know, when he goes back home, will he be respected as a man? Um, so, and it's actually a portrait of a bully that used to actually uh, bully me back in the day in the neighborhood, and this was my payback. <laughs> And um, it's, uh, it's, painted, it's painted on, a, on an actual door that I, I you know, uh, was able to obtain from a junkyard out in Arizona where they kept a lot of the residue helicopters from both Korea and Vietnam. This is one of the uh, doors that I, I took, so it was appropriately. And this is, uh, you know, the power of media, the power of, you know, uh, indoctrinating, uh, you know, um, loss of hope and entertainment at the same time with that loss of hope. So I just was, I found it very strange that uh, the, 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 the news um, networks were so vigilant in like just making sure that you just did not turn that channel and that, you know, you stayed put and glued to that like they still do. And, it's, and I felt like, wow, they're really selling entertainment with violence and, and um, loss of faith and hate. Uh, of course, back to the conflict in Southeast Asia. Uh, Air America, you know, um, the infiltration of drugs through that whole network with that war as a cover, perfect disguise for, um, for, 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 for the substance that came and ended up on the streets uh, of New York and many other cities. Um, but this painting is here called Requiem, and it was uh, commissioned by a, a client uh, uh, of mine that um, has uh, many, um, he, he's a Marine himself. He never went to Vietnam, but he actually uh, was very passionate about um, having the discussion of like why that war happened and many wars after that um, that are senseless. And this is, um, a painting uh, called Pass the Dawn On To You. Um, my sister passed away from AIDS. So this was like uh, a portrait of her in my arms where I felt. That she had more strength. 
and I was the deck of cards. And that's why I felt that that portrait was more the, um, you know, the fence where there's two sides uh, that have been affected by something like that. And this is a new work called Golpe de Suelte, basically serendipity about family structure and, um, you know, just uh, entertaining yourself with what you have experienced in the family and how that makes you and galvanizes you into the person that you are. And uh, I just felt that um, this is something that just like, it's, it's just coming out naturally of me right now in my work. So um, it's a work in progress actually, it's still, it's not finished really, but I wanted to bring it and share it with y'all. This is a detail of that same painting. Um, yeah, and you know, I, I've always, I've always felt that um, artists, in closing, I've always felt that artists, uh, uh, they have a pulse. They, the, the responsibility that they have is they have to have a finger on the pulse of society, but they also have to be very honest with themselves, and they also have to have a little touch of um, humor in their work because that's the way sometimes you can address really serious issues through humor in the work. And sometimes that's where the fine print is at, and it speaks a lot louder than actual fact. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the imagery that I wanted to share with y'all. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, being on the panel with these great people, and I'm so happy to be invited. Um, but also because um, this is my first time uh, speaking at the Schomburg, which is the reason that I am an artist, because my mother worked here for 13 years since I was, I don't know, four or five, and Dr. Jones was 12. Um, and so it's just kind of really just amazing to, uh, to, to actually be speaking here. And I'm gonna to talk to you about a project that's a collaborative project called Question Bridge Black Males, which I did with uh, three other artists, uh, Chris Johnson, who kind of was the originator of the concept of a Question Bridge, Kamal Sinclair, and Bayate Ross-Smith. And what we're really excited about is that we will be showing it next fall here at the Schomburg, so uh, this is kind of a preview. But a Question Bridge is basically what we call a video-mediated conversation between people who are kind of put into a group and how they relate to one another in the group. And so we did a question bridge around African-American men where we traveled the country asking African-American men to ask and answer each other's questions. So I'm gonna show you uh, a brief trailer from what came of that experience. Uh-oh. Uh Black man. Do you want to get out of the situation that you're in? What is the reluctance for taking responsibility for improving our communities? Are your children better or worse off as a result of your involvement? Why wouldn't you be happy with your son being gay? Why are you so violent? Why do you have that take mentality? Why are you afraid of being intelligent? Why? 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 What I want to know is why? I believe that we've incorporated a lot of things that are unhealthy to us. We are supposed to be tough. I can't let them see no type of sucker. Along with various other stereotypes. The level of mentorship in our community is not as strong as it possibly could be. When I came up, crack was a quick way for a black man to make a million dollars. Sometimes I think because we think we're black, we, we're some other kind of human beings, but we're just like most other human beings. Why? didn't y'all leave us the blueprint. We did leave you a blueprint. We just didn't tell you where it was. That's something that we dropped the ball on. What do you fear? That something will harm my children. I fear success. Am I the only one who has problem eating chicken, watermelon, and bananas in front of white people? <laughs> God, I don't know, bro. Y'all niggas crazy. That word, we have to stop using it. I think black people can say nigga anytime they want. How dare you? What, what right do you have to use this word? A lot of nigga questions for the rapper. 
What is common to all of us that we can say makes us who we are? Hmm. This is the easiest question in the world to answer. The thing that we have in common is that we are male and we are black. All right, my question is, I try to live good, but I'm surrounded by bad. And I want to know what it is I could do to do better and live peaceful, surrounded by all evil. How can, how can I do that? So as you can see, there was a huge variety of, of, uh, of questions that, that came from this process. And what we really found amazing, because I, I wanted, as an African-American man, I felt like it was important for me to know what it meant to be a black man. And so I, I thought I would ask other men, African men, American men to ask these questions so that maybe we might have a consensus. And what we found was there was no consensus on a way to be a, a black man in America. And one of the questions that we started off with early is this, a, a guard at the museum of the Birmingham Museum of Art, uh, where Question Bridge is just opening tomorrow, actually. Um, and he brought the, he asked this question. You know, I wonder, black man, are you really ready for freedom? And if not, what will it take for you to want and need this freedom? So um, I thought that was a pretty profound question for him to ask, but also felt a little bit generic. It was, so we showed it to a lot of people. Um, and literally, we would just take that question on a, on, on, a, um, on a laptop and show it to the person. And this was a person in the San Francisco County Jail. And this is literally three seconds after him uh, hearing this question or looking at the question. Am I ready for freedom? And what would it take for me to want that freedom? First, I would have to stop and ask myself, and I would have to go, that's, I mean, that's, that's a tough question. Because freedom to me is a mind state. You know, because you got some people that's not in jail that's not free. You know, you got people that's in prison in dysfunctional relationships. You got people that's in prison with jobs. They work nine to five that they don't like. Some people are in prison with alcohol and drug abuse. So I would have to, uh, I would have to really ask myself what's in prison in me. And what's been in prison in me is my self-esteem, my lack of self-esteem. My lack of self-esteem has led me to commit crime, to hurt people, to manipulate people, right? Because if I love myself, there's no way I could walk, around, walk outside this room and punch somebody if I'm esteemed within myself. So to be free to me would have to be, I would have to change, you know? So in order for me to grow, I'd have to change because if change is necessary for growth, in order for me to grow, I would have to adapt the, I would have to adapt the mentality that something's got to change in me, I have to change my mind state. I'd have to change the way I talk. I'd have to change the people I, I interact with. That would be free. And for me, that was just a really profound, deep answer just to come from such a simple question. And what we found in this experience was that, like, you know, you, the last place you'd think you'd get some of the most real thoughtful answers are, are in, in jail. And I think that comes with the prejudice of thinking about how people wind up in jail. And, and some of the questions led us to there. And in a way, uh, some of the people who are more academic, no offense to anybody in the room, are, t are, you know, are, are used to um, saying their script. And so in a way, their answers are more rehearsed and, and less raw and, and in a certain way less thoughtful to a, a sincere question. Uh, this is a question that we asked that kind of um, really sh proves that. There's two I different just answers know here. What is so cool about selling crack? Can someone tell me that? Well, as far as for myself, when I came up, crack was a quick way for a black man to make a million dollars. I'm 40 years old. In 85, when the crack scene hit, I was 15, 16 years old, watching two parents work dog hard to death and watching the dude next door who was selling crack riding big cars. To me, I thought that was cool. And once I, once I learned how to sell crack and learned how to acquire my own money, and still learn how to have things white folks was having and get up when I want to get up. To me, that was cool. Ain't nothing cool about being out there, taking life chances, sitting on that quarter, not knowing what's going to occur at any given minute, trying to get some what material possession. Ain't nothing cool out there, man. 
Man, oppressing my people because I'm hurt, hurt people, hurt people. Ain't nothing cool with that. Ain't nothing cool with me selling crack to my mama. Taking the Christmas toys away from my little siblings because I'm charging my mama a hundred for a dime on credit. Ain't nothing cool knocking my daddy out because he stole my bundle. My bundle of crack, that is. Ain't nothing cool for me taking my sister to go prostitute on the track to get some money because what? I wasn't have, I didn't have that, that supposedly childhood that society wanted me to have. Ain't nothing cool for me selling a pregnant woman crack, man. Ain't nothing cool at that. Nothing cool at all. Ain't nothing cool for me to sit here and have to subject myself to such harm because I want a future. I want a better life. Ain't nothing cool with that at all. Because, man, I got an answer for everything I do, for my actions and inactions. And I've been a part of bullshit. And I didn't see it on the streets. I was blinded to what? That delusion of grandeur. Thinking that I'm greater than life itself. And I wasn't. You feel me? I'm responsible for hell and hurt that I didn't cause people like broken families out there. I'm responsible for children that's incarcerated right now as we speak. I'm incarcerated for death out there based on me selling crack because I never know what a person had to do or go get it. You feel me? I'm responsible for that shit. Ain't nothing cool with that. And at nighttime, I sit and I sleep in my cell, man, and I sit there lost in thoughts, man. Damn! When nightmares start to arrive, like, Tiki, you fucked up again. I fucked up. I didn't know what I was out there doing, but I did because it was the greed, the money. You feel me? And now, how am I feel when somebody sell my son some crack? You feel me? How am I feel when my wife get older and man, she sell her, somebody sell her crack? Shit, man, it ain't cool. It ain't cool at all, man. And, man, everybody gotta pay for what they done, man. And, and this, you feel me, this is a form of me paying for what all they done out there to that community, man. Because it go deeper than crack. It go back to all them little kids that seen me out there and I didn't take time to talk to them or let them know that they are love. So we talking about a substance issue. That's, it's deeper than that substance. It's just a genuine courtesy. You're just telling somebody, man, you are love. I'm responsible for a lot of things. And, um, man, ain't no answer for that, man. You're just sitting here with the bullshit I created, man. To sit here and watch my people sit here and cry. Babies, crack babies. That's in the womb, that's unborn, that's undeveloped, missing one ear. I'm responsible for that shit. I'm responsible for this reception. I'm responsible for everything. I hold myself accountable. Shit. But I've been committed suicide a long time ago when I was a part of that bullshit. Now I claim my life. And I'm a part of something that's greater. And that's the solution. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's just so powerful um, what a, how this really, this project is about the generosity of a question and how a question can really unlock so many things that are deep inside of us just waiting to come out. And uh, I just really want to thank Tamara Warren for being one of the first people to write about the project and Jamel Shabazz for offering some really beautiful um, contributions to the project. And so why don't you come up here and... Um, <laughs> Show us uh, what's what's what. I would like to first thank uh, Professor Roberts and Megan for affording me this wonderful opportunity to come here and share my vision. I'm so uh, touched by what I just saw. This is hard. I worked 20 years in a, in, in a prison complex, 20 years of my life as a correctional officer. I saw that every day.
Every day in my life, I saw men like that. That's what gave me the fortitude to stand up and, and have the strength to move forward and save my, my people. I need help with the program right here, but I, I have to, uh, if, as the uh, assistant aids me here, I could just drop the, drop the Jews here, but I'm so pained because I dealt with brothers like that every day. I worked 20 years in corrections, been retired for 10. I came into consciousness at the age of 15, and I was, I was you know, Roots inspired me. It freed the chains from my brain when Roots came on back in 1977. It gave me an understanding on who I was as a man and what I needed to do. You know, the, the men that taught Malcolm taught me and put me on the right path, gave me the knowledge to Jews to move forward. So my whole life mission is about saving young men and all men. That's what I'm all about. My whole life is geared towards that. The camera has been that tool to confront young men on the street corners that were selling drugs or thinking about it, and I would tell them how beautiful and special they were. I told them I saw the greatness in you. I told them I saw hope in the future. That's my whole life mission. This camera was given to me this, the gift of photography was given to me by my father. And I realized, in looking at the viewfinder, I saw hope, I saw a promise, and he gave me a voice. So at the age of 15, I went out and I just started just talking to young people about the time that we're living and how we must move forward and know ourselves, how we, how we must respect our women, how we must stop calling ourselves niggas and calling our women hoes, but we must look at ourselves as being kings and righteous men and look at our women as being queens. That was my message at 15 years old. That's all I wanted to do. When I read the autobiography of Malcolm X, it changed my life. And when I saw how Malcolm would go on the street corners and talk to the young men and the prostitutes and the drug addicts, it gave me a purpose. I said, that's what I want to do, but now I have the camera to do it with. So the camera, the camera became my compass that guided me on the path. So when I look at these young men speak, I dealt with it every day of my life, every single day. And once I get my program up, I can actually show you some of these young men in my journey and why I am the way I am. But the tears are tears of pain, and I still feel it to this very day. Not a day goes by where I don't think about it. Gil Scott Heron was one of my great teachers. And when you have an opportunity, if you really want to feel the pain and understand why I feel the way I do, listen to his song called The, Prison the Prisoner. I would listen to it every day as I would travel to work to remind me that the possibilities of me being on the inside are there too. And it helped me have empathy for those that were incarcerated. So I'm a product of the 1960s, the Vietnam War. I went in the military at the age of 17. I saw drug addiction over in Germany. I saw countless young men ODing off of heroin in Germany. And I said, when I come home, I'm going to change that. I was inspired by Gordon's War. So when I returned home from the military in 1980, I came home to a war zone. I came home, the brothers dying in the street corner. I knew killers and victims. It's like, what the hell is going on here? Here I am in the military. I'm coming home to a war zone, and so many people were dying. And it broke my heart. So I said, I have to be proactive, and I got I to gotta use my voice to stop the killing. Jamil, is this yours? Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, right Sorry. there. No, we just didn't know which okay. one was. Yeah. So do bear with me. The tears are tears of pain. And uh, this is so ironic right here. I pulled this up the other day. Paul Robeson speaking here in 1946. And it was that statement that he made, artists are the gatekeepers of the truth, that Harry Balafonte passed on to me. So now I have the baton for Harry Belafonte and all the great men that came before, and I have to move forward with that baton. But these are images that reflect my journey right here. This photograph was taken by Leonard Fried. At the age of nine years old, I had the book Black and White America, and I saw this photograph, and it blew me away. The first picture I ever saw of men incarcerated. And what's so deep about this photograph is that Leonard Fried wrote what some of the young men were saying. I, I quote, help me, I need a lawyer. I've been here for three months. Tell my family I'm here. I'm innocent, I cannot live here anymore. It will be bloodshed. In the book, Black and White America, nine years old, I saw this, and I realized there was a problem in this country. The Vietnam War inspired me. You know, the Civil Rights Movement. These are the images that I saw to help formulate ideas in my mind at a very young age. Again, the autobiography of Malcolm X. This is a photograph I took in Harlem a few years ago, and it reminds me of myself and how Malcolm put me on the path through that, that one book. Still Post, if you have an opportunity, Still Post educated me when I was in Germany. And their song, uh, uh, Steve Biko Died in Chains. And it, ta it taught me about the suffering of Steve Biko in South Africa, in South Africa, how he was brutalized by the police department. But this one group educated me to, to, to Biko and Malcolm and Mandela and the struggle in South Africa. Very important group. 
the Vietnam War again. This helped to open up the door because so many people died in that war. So many fathers and uncles and brothers died in Vietnam. I will never forget that. I respect Muhammad Ali for standing up and making that statement. But we have to think about those young men that had no choice that went over there. I think about the prison riots at Long Bend Prison. People don't even know about that. Stay Long Bend, a prison in Vietnam where you had a 90 cent black population that were incarcerated in Vietnam, came home with dishonorable discharges. Think about the men wounded. When I would do searches in the jail cell, I would find so many young men whose fathers were in Vietnam and died. So we lost a generation of men that went to Vietnam and came home addicted to heroin and PTSD. This is a photograph by Eugene Richards taking the Red Hook Project. The heroin epidemic in the 1960s took another generation away. And we think about how heroin got in this country. This is a photograph I took to, to manifest my anger about Vietnam from an old Black Panther newspaper. This book changed my life. I read it in 1979 when I was in Germany. And it's through this book that helped me to understand the inmates, those that were incarcerated. This book I owe so much to was to help give me guidance and direction as a young man. The Prison Letters of George, George Jackson. You want to understand incarceration? Read that. A young man was so brilliant and died so young. The Attica Rebellion. I'll never forget this here. And due to Attica, understanding what took place at Attica helped me to understand my role as a correction officer. Because one of the demands was they wanted more people of, of color. So I knew that when I went in there, I had a role and responsibility to try to serve as, as a mentor to a lot of young men. This is a photograph I took a few years ago to, to manifest my anger again. So I try to use my imagery, my ability to see, to make people think, to create thought-provoking images. This speaks for itself right here, merchants of death and what's happening in our community. This, is a, this photograph was taken in the train station of a young man, in a sense, reaching out to me, trying to escape the hardships of the concrete in the street. So my mission is to try to save these type of young men. I see them every day of my life. Short eyes. If you ever get an opportunity, if you want to see about prison and what it was like, before I became a correctional officer, I watched this, and it horrified me. What it taught me in, about in, in watching this film was the fact that you had an innocent man going through the system and how he was dealt with. And I think about the countless innocent people incarcerated who are being brutalized and being broken down and who suffer from PTSD. You have over three, almost nearly 300,000 American soldiers that served in Iraq and Afghanistan that suffer from PTSD. But what about the incarcerated and what they go through when they come home? Another photograph to manifest my anger. You know, this is my brother I went in the military with, you know, who, who's down with me. And something that we saw because Reaganomics did it. Reaganism changed everything, and it's very real. You know, this just represents one of my co-workers on the job. Good men and women who take on these city jobs and try to improve our lives. So it's not always about hate. We see people in uniform, we make the assumption they're our enemy, but a lot of us is trying to make it. These are young men who I had that I work with every day in my housing area, who I try to just work with every day and just show them an example. I would encourage them to read and write, and I tried to just hope, give them promise for the future. So while I was there, I had to be a mentor. The administration sometimes hated me because I called them gentlemen, but I wasn't gonna call them scumbags and mutts and all that. No, they were from my community. So my thing was trying to give them guidance and show them photographs as a form of visual medicine. So they, a lot of times it, 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 it stops here. We, under, we need to understand conflict resolution. So I'm trying to teach young men how to understand that, how to think strategically. I never wanted to be like this here. Regardless of the circumstances, I never wanted to ever be this way. But I took this photograph to remind me that I cannot be this way. Sometimes there's circumstances in, in, in prison where you have to re retain a person, but I just wanted to maintain trying to be an upright person. The crack epidemic changed everything, and it, it, it trapped up so many good people fell victim to that damn crack cocaine. It ruined us. They gave us crack, Scarface, and a 40 ounce. And then they changed the music. I grew up listening to Curtis Mayfield, Marvin Gaye, The Last Poet. And everything just changed when crack came. And it, it was like a trap that destroyed so many good young brothers. This is a cell I used to, an area I used to work at the Manhattan Court Building, the 100 Center Street. I would oftentimes place myself in a cell to remind me that it's a thin line. This is what I'm trying to help. I'm trying to stop. I call this photograph what now? I had a dream about gang violence and how we, it was a time we got killed for the color of our skin. Now we're killing each other over colors. So I created this scenario to tell a story and I call it what now? In the game of chess, in order to move, you have to have black, black or white, but on the board you have a red board, a red and black board, the red represents blood and the black represents the, the killing of one another. So you have two opposing gang members who can't move. 
So now what do you do? What now? Thank you. And sadly, sadly, that young brother was murdered. A good man trying to bring about change in good community, murdered. Never made the 30. Most of my brothers, my good brothers, have lost their brothers. Practically every young man I knew I grew up with, his brother got murdered. So my tears are tears of pain and anger. And I'm just trying to use my voice to make a difference right now. So I, I thank everyone, and I'm so happy that this conference came because this is therapeutic for me. Uh, the next 10 minutes is for Jamal Shabazz. So many years ago, I was incarcerated uh, not only in Rikers Island, but in Ohio. I mean, that's what, that's what uh, became part of a phase in hip hop culture was that, you know, when Nick's, you know, Nick's ran for 20s down south, right? So, you know, when the, the corners were flooded with too much drug dealing and the competition was so heavy, you had to move to another location. And sometimes that location was another state and we moved to Ohio. And in Ohio, it was the first time I ever related to a sense of poverty, because even though I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, I grew up very different from my friends. Just because you're from the projects don't make you a thug, you know? Uh, and I say that because in my household, my mother was the drug dealer, and my friends had good homes. Even though they were in the projects, there was food on the table. In my household, it was very different. And when I went to Ohio, I noticed that everyone was living like I, how I lived growing up, that poverty was at an all time. I thought New York City was the only place in America that was stricken with the poverty I had in my household. So what I'm going to do is just read you an excerpt. And I, I kind of read uh, the way I do is I write plays. I'm a playwright and poet. Uh, Nothing new under the sun I follow in the, in the tradition of August Wilson and Tennessee Williams and T.S. Eliot and Shakespeare, and I'm just carrying the torch. So this is a, a transition from being incarcerated in Rikers Island to uh, going to Ohio. And uh, a great, great officer named Officer Brown, I was in high impact boot camp. Uh, he was a great mentor of mine. So I'm going to introduce you to a character named Officer Brown. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Anderson, get your suspicious mulatto ass on the floor right now and give me 50 push-ups, and it better be the Bruce Lee kind. Then I want you to run to the corner of the sprung, stick your face in the corner and yell 10 times. Discipline is a willful obedience to all lawful orders, respect for authority, and surf alliance. And if you don't end it on sir, every time you say it, I will double up. You goddamn hear me. And when you're done, I need you to come back here and do work detail. And you better have them floors polished to Broadway. Looks like a glass lake. You call those Bruce Lee push-ups? If I would have known you was going to Bruce Leroy those push-ups, I would have told you to kiss my my converts, get up, boy. Chin up. Everybody else your platoon is sent to this program for violating parole. You, on the other hand, chose to be here. You chose this program, so with Officer Brown drill instructor, if you give one shit, I will give back to you. Hear me? And that's sir. Yes, sir. Now get to the corner of the sprungs and run it. After two months of boot camp, they stick me back in population right out my time. I look weird to the rest of the inmates in my cell block. I know it's because I don't look comfortable being here. You see, I don't care about phone time, stacking day room chairs, can't stand the sight of these men wasting their time playing meaningless games of spades, fighting over a television they don't own, killing over a meal they ain't make, not me, no way. You won't catch me smiling on Rikers Island. I'm finna hold on to my discipline. I'm gonna pray harder than the in-house preacher, outread the prison law librarian, Keep hospital corners on my bed to feel normal. I'm going to go back to my cell, lock my gate, sit on a stack of books and read. How Steve Beagle died so we can write what we like. How Haj Malik Shabazz passed. Now they think twice before they whoop our ass. Because of Jackson George, we deserve to see this sky. Because if you look real close, you can see blood in my eye. 
We can't rely on the school system, false education they sold me, but we can rely on American history lies my teacher told me. Stick my face in them books, cause my habits to read by force, and behold, I see a pale white horse. Because in them books is all the answers that I seek. Wonder why my mother was stronger than my father, read the feminine mystique. You hate the man, but not as much as you should hate the man that hate your sister, but you don't know real hate till you read Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler. You don't know the rules of power, believe me, I'm not convinced. You know white lies, white lies knows Niccolo Machiavelli Prince. Attica, Attica, Attica. I run into a poem written by a three-time felon about how his cold heart would bake warm cookies at the sight of seeing his first love again. I wish I could have wrote that one. Every day I look towards that New York City skyline out in the prison yard and I count the wake-ups till I face the ultimate haiku. The worst thing about doing a bit in prison is coming back home. All right, thank you. So, you know, the journey for me as a writer really started in prison. Uh, I had time. Uh, it was the only place I had time. I had three hots in a cot. I didn't have to worry about that back home. I mean, I, I worried about that back home. I didn't have to worry about that in Rikers Island. And I, was, I took on this program, a boot camp program, that really showed me discipline. And so I, was, I, was, I taught myself how to get up with a mentor drilling me at 5 in the morning and learning how to take new habits on. And with that came these books. And the responsibility to the knowledge that the books had, right? You know, these books had all this great knowledge inside, but I needed to use them. But the hardest part, again, was coming out and becoming a part of society. But the beautiful thing about art is that art doesn't discriminate, right? You just got to be good. You just got to be good at art. You got to be great. It's even better. So with me, I began exploring how do I tell the stories of my generation? Uh, in County of Kings, the journey I took was that I wanted to, I saw a film called American Pop, I don't know if ever, um, uh, by a great filmmaker named Ralph Bakshi. Uh, I think it's Ralph Bakshi. American Pop. And it told, it told five generations of an American, uh, a, a Russian Jewish family that, that came over to America and music followed them. It was like they went from jazz to a certain beat generation and rock. And then all of a sudden, it, it's just, you just started watching music grow with this family as they were dealing with their addictions in the world. And I wanted to do that to hip hop culture. And when I wrote County of Kings, I felt like hip hop was bigger than rap and bigger than graffiti and bigger than DJing and bigger than, uh, than the elements, right? The elements are, are good and they're strong, but my mother was a part of hip hop culture. You know, my mother Millie was very important to me growing up as a dancer because she had this fire that she gave me. And I wanted to tell that journey. And part of that journey, not only for me, was being incarcerated, but for all of us, for my whole generation. Because that story is not just my generation or my story. It's everyone I grew up with. Uh, and so that was the, the ride I took. And then I fought hard for it to be at the public theater, right? If you don't know that story. Um, to be able to transcend our culture into really great spaces, which is so important to me. I just didn't want to tell my story in a small black box theater, and I give credit to all you know, the young, talented artists who are doing that nowadays and cutting their teeth. But it's very important that the subscription audience hears this story. The audience that's already there. And then I started bringing my own audience because they made the ticket a little cheaper for me. That worked out. Uh, but it's not really about a cheap ticket either. It's just about... Is the theater speaking for us? Am I going to see a play that speaks for me? Or are you putting me on to culture? Uh, and I learned that from August Wilson, which is really special. So the new play that I'm working on is called Toast. And what we're dealing with in Toast is, uh, you know, I'm really fascinated by the uprising in Attica. And I'm fascinated by this amazing folklore hero who we know as Dolomite. And Dolomite does not come from the black exploitation era. He goes way beyond before that, right? He's part of a world of black narratives and oral tradition called toasting. Stagger Lee, Boo Hill McCoy, 
Jesse James, Hobo Ben. These characters that I put in, the, uh, in this setting in Attica and Toast in the new play that I'm putting up at the public, it was important for me to put these characters instead of putting the actual characters from the uprising. Same voice, but I wanted to pay tribute to these great folklore heroes that I, I fell in love with while I was in prison and I was reading poetry because I read a great poem by Etheridge Knight uh, called Shine and the Titanic. And with that, you know, that's the next step is to be able to stage a, a play, a drama about the uprising and the precursor of what's to come for this great folklore hero before he becomes a black exploitation character. Because in 1971, Dolomite goes out and becomes this black exploitation character. Before that happens, this is his story, Toast. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. Well, I'm going to start out with the first question. First of all, thank you to all our panelists. I've never been a moderator where I really didn't have to use my <laughs> my force as a moderator. So thank you all for being so on point. Um, I'm, I'm going to start it off um, with a question that, uh, based on Professor Roberts' questions uh, that he asked in uh, the materials, um, you know, what are, it's his third question, what are the available opportunities to repair and strengthen our social and community networks as well as our public health response to problems which the war on drugs either created or exacerbated. And um, I'm wondering if our panelists can talk about how art can do that, how their practice can do that, or can it, right? I mean, we have this idea of art as healing. Um, I, I love what you said, Lemon, you know, art doesn't discriminate, um, but is it too much uh, to put that role on art, to put that pressure on art, right? That it can in some way uh, heal these communities as people have been talking about in terms of, you know, health centers in the communities as a site to heal communities. Is, is that the role for art or is it something else in terms of the war on drugs? So anybody can jump in and My answer. art, I, I, I view it as a form of visual medicine. And I strive to use my, my vision to inspire people and make them feel good. I show photographs of fathers with their children and mothers with their children. I show images of love. But what I've done back in the days, I mean, the camera was just my compass. But what was important to me was to talk to young people about health. You know, I speak about the, the camera. Just, it was more about talking to the people than anything. The photograph became evidence of the conversation. But I used to speak to young men and women about smoking cigarettes. It's like, yo, we got to get off the cigarettes. It's killing us. And, I, and that was my message. And, and so I got the photograph. It was more about just building about, we got to take care of our health, then I'll take the photograph. I spoke about the importance of eating fruit and staying away from poisonous foods. So having a person stand in front of me for a few seconds allowed me just to talk to them. It wasn't about that photograph. I just wanted to talk to you and let you know we have to take care of our health. We are dying of high blood pressure more than anyone else, diabetes. Everything, every major social ill we are dying from. And as an artist, I feel I have a responsibility to, to sound the alarm and talk to them. I had a lot of brothers that were struggling, didn't know how to make it. You know, I remember, you know, brothers asked me, can I borrow five dollars? I want to go get something to eat, you know, from McDonald's or from Kentucky Fried Chicken. I said, brother, look, you can take five dollars, get yourself a few bags of navy beans to have some bean soup. You can get some uh, water and lemon. You know, you could boil some warm water in lemon, you have lemonade or some hot, you know, a, a lemon be beverage. You don't have to make, waste your money if something's going to kill you. So as an artist, I try to engage people about health and taking care of ourselves. That's very vital for me, you know, but that we have to eat right. And because um, we're dying. You, you look around in Harlem, I mean, there's so many people dying. So many people have lost body limbs because of diabetes. So I feel as an artist, I have to raise my voice and talk about these issues. Again, the visual medicine, to show pictures of people who look good. And when I see people who are taking care of themselves, I confront them and say, excuse me, brother, sister, with all due respect, may I take a photograph of you because you look so beautiful. Y'all must be eating right, you know? And they got it, you know? And, that's, and it made them feel that, it made them feel that we are, I'm, I, am, I am on the right path because somebody recognizes that in me. So I try to encourage people as I see them and say, man, you looking good, brother. Gotta get a picture of you. 
You know, so that's how I use my voice as, as an artist to address the issue of health every single day. I have a problem with the cigarettes, the alcohol, and all that. I was taught early on you replace the bad habit with a good habit. When I was younger, I had plenty, of, I drank plenty of old, old English in my day. Malt liquor <laughs> killing me and my generation. Until a wise man approached me one day and said, brother, you have, to, you have to replace the bad habit with a good habit. So I put that old English and picked up the quarter orange juice. You know, I put, I put the dice away, picked up the chessboard. So I feel as artists, we have the ability to transmit messages, to educate and inspire. If I if I may add, um, I've always believed that art is very uh, is very revealing and healing uh, uh, in, in very powerful ways more than than you can see on the tabloids or even hearsay because it's something that comes. It's, um, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, it's rehearsed in someone's mind and in their studio or even in the streets or in the subway yard um, and put out from a good place. And I think that in the last 20 or 30 years, um, the power of art coming from people that didn't have, ex uh, you know, accessibility um, uh, or ability to, 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 you know, to the fine arts, um, that they started creating their own avenue of expression. And a lot of people from various uh, backgrounds, um, particularly from poor backgrounds, were, felt that they, they could um, they can adapt to this, they can digest this, and they can, they can uh, the work was very applicable to their times. Um, and I think that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful, powerful force that, that art has, and I think, uh, I think it still will always be. It reflects the times, and good art should reflect the times, should ask questions, it should answer questions, um, and, and sometimes just leave it on the table for, for another time, you know? I don't know if that may, made sense with that, but. Any other no. responses? I think it depends on the artist. I, I mean, I, I would say, um, um, it really, one of the things that I, I struggle with our contemporary, the world that I grew up in at least, where art is something which uh, people review passively, is that it doesn't encourage others to kind of engage. You know, when we have people who are considered masters, it doesn't, it makes the rest of us feel less able to use our voices. And so I would say that the more people who are making art, you know, the, and the more, the broader range of work that people are making it doesn't have to all speak literally or directly, it can speak to um, kind of evolution of thought. And I think that that does make a difference, but it has to be much more participatory than it is at the current level. I, I mean, it just kind of, I mean, I love being in discourse with my peers, but I wish I had 10 times as many peers. <laughs> uh, you know, being a performing artist, puts me, especially performing arts, not necessarily acting or musician, but the performing art world, uh, puts me in classrooms a lot, you know? So uh, a lot of times when I do tour the plays, I ask that I have a diverse uh, group of outreaching that's connected to the play. So I'll do a prep school and then I'll do a prison purposely because I feel that all young people should be taught, uh, but what I when I when I go in uh, and I speak to these men and women who are incarcerated, and I have to go out to Madison, Wisconsin, in two weeks and speak to some young uh, young men and women who are incarcerated there. I try not to do a lot of speaking. I do a lot of teaching and follow a curriculum, because I am there to teach them what they can probably use to move forward. And I can, I, I've been in situations where I I could do a Q and A for an hour. And it just it motivated and it was great, but I felt like I could have done a whole lot better if I actually taught them how to fish, right? And so I would sit in these rooms and teach them subordination for verbal measures, tonal consideration, all this stuff I learned in uh, these great institutions as an actor. Uh, that's important for me as an artist. Uh, sometimes it's more important than the actual work on stage is that I get to tell these stories and do a post discussion. So that is part of my job, because I get to speak, and they want to get a little bit of it, but I'll just teach them it, because someone did that for me. Someone mentored me. Why can't I just do that? 
I, I don't want to be the artist that holds a secret. I'm not going to show nobody how to do this. <laughs> One more question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, I wanted to start with Hank. Lemon already addressed it, but maybe you all, uh, Jamel and Lee, can also speak to this. Um, have you shown your work in prison? Uh, I was speaking, uh, thinking of Hank because you had these amazing clips that you, uh, for blackmail, that are obviously taken in the prison. And I'm wondering if those people or others um, in various prisons will get an opportunity to see blackmail as well. Is that something that's a possibility, Hank? Um, well, that was in San, um, San Francisco County Jail 5, and we did do a screening of the project there. Chris, my collaborator, actually it's interesting that the question is what, what brought us to the prison. And, um, and so Chris started to teach meditation in the jails as a way of kind of getting access, which allowed us to bring the cameras in there. Um, I th I, with my work, I've always, it's, it's, I've always struggled to figure out, I, I get so angry and upset about the system that I haven't yet figured out a comfortable way to talk about, you know, that's not violent. <laughs> to talk about kind of my, my disappointment, honestly, because it is, as we all know, it's a, a form of modern slavery. And the fact that we are also complacent, not all of us, but I am definitely more complacent than I'm comfortable with, makes me feel very uncomfortable. And so I think, so with the work that I've been working on more lately, I've been really trying to figure out how to address these, this current situation in a way that kind of, um, not just kind of like, I don't want to be there, and I don't think anybody else sh should be there. So trying to figure out how the work can kind of not go there to entertain people who don't belong there in the first place, but help to get them out of the situation in the first place. So. In terms of my work, it was always about those that were incarcerated. My book, A Time Before Crack, was created for a lot of young brothers upstate in, in the various state prisons because I wanted them to see what, how life was before crack. <clears throat> so with the time before crack, knowing that, you know, under the Rockefeller laws, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of young men and women were incarcerated. So I knew they had time to think, says, let me put out this book, keep it affordable, and make sure it gets into the prison system too. Let people look at it and reflect. And so much came out of it. It served, again, as a form of visual medicine. A lot of men who once sold drugs, they looked at people in the book who they might have taken out. They might have, you know, took, they might have murdered them. Uh, there's certain photographs of women that were once so beautiful, and then once crack came, they fell victim. So now the person who sold drugs is seeing that. And it's making them think and reflect. And that's what, that was what my work was all designed to do, you know, to make people think, especially those that, you know, the underclass. As a correction officer, I always brought in my portfolios to show young people constantly, because I want them to see hope and promise and just see another life. So, you know, the institutions became my, my uh, art galleries, and, and I always carry my portfolio and my camera. And so many stories came out of the photographs that I would share. You know, one very interesting story, you know, I showed a young man who I was mentoring in a photograph, and then I came to find out that he murdered one of the people in the photographs. You know, he actually took my good friend out. You know, but nevertheless, it was something I had to experience. So, uh, you know, I miss it honestly because I felt I was doing great work in the jail. And, uh, you know, again, I'm retired for 10 years and I feel like there's a void, you know, because despite as much as I, I didn't like going to work, or not, I, I can't say I didn't like going to work, but I felt that they needed me there. I felt I was a very different type of officer that really cared. You know, I, I understood empathy. And I found that my photography served as, as a way of helping young people, not only the photography, but the hundreds of books I would give out to young men to try to encourage them. So I do miss it every single day because I realize that it has to be done. I'm trying to encourage other photographers to, to perhaps get on that job and, and go get in the work, because that's where the people are at, you know? It's a lot of young minds that need to be cultivated in the prison system, in photography and art, really art. You know, I met so many genius artists. Two of the deepest guys I met incarcerated with subway pushers, you know, one subway pusher, you know, he, he, I can't recall his name, he pushed a young man in front of a train, he lost his legs but retained his life. But he was a great artist, he was mentally ill, but he, he was a great portrait artist and something must have went wrong in his life. 
you know, that, that led him astray, but he was so skilled, you know, and uh, I just saw a lot of hope and so much talent amongst young men. Even some of the men who came home from being incarcerated, they came home and wanted to be photographers because of the work in which I shared with them. You know, so, you know, work, sharing art in prison is very important. You know, it's, it's a lot of good people incarcerated. They need help. I mean, you look at the life of Malcolm. You think of Martin, uh, Martin Luther King, they were incarcerated. Steve, was so many people. So we can't forget them because if we neglect them, they're going to be home one day. I, know, I remember back in the days, you know, we look at people and say, wow, this person's going to be in jail for 20 years, you know, for crack. And you treat them like animals. Now the person's coming home. And he, he's been treated like an animal all his life. What do you expect? If you treat people indifferent, you never know. I mean, I, I knew a guy that they hated in the system, a young man who kept saying he was innocent. And he, he ended up being convicted. He did 20 years. And just recently, he was found to be innocent. So this man was subjected to all that hell, and he was innocent the whole time. You know, so I think about that a lot, of the innocent people that need hope. So I, I try to, you know, bring hope to young men and promise by showing them my work. But I, I just also just have to add, but I also don't know in our society who can be called guilty. Because uh, I feel like as I've become more aware of the opportunities that people with money have to exploit so many others in the situations that put other people in, I really question the justice at all. You know, so it's not a matter of, um, in my opinion, because you know, my cousin was a victim of, of homicide and the guys who killed him are um, on death row. And I felt very uncomfortable with that, not because I don't think that they had all the liberties and opportunities for them to be able to think different and to act different. Not everyone necessarily has someone like you or, 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 or the people I've had in my life. And you know, people get away with murder, as we know, every day. And we celebrate them, we smile, you know, we pay them. And I feel like I'm, that's where I struggle. But sorry. Well, I just, I just want to share, like, in developing a, this play, you know, there's a young man, there's a relationship between an older man who's done 27 years and a younger man who just got in. And, of course, there's that dynamic in, in prison and in jail. There's always a young kid full of fire and anger and fast pace and this older man who's just done his time, you know, and is slowed down and his pace is slowed down and exploring that uh, and staging that for an audience, it's been an interesting dynamic of brotherhood, you know? And also, as at the same time, it's, you got it? Right. <laughs> no, I just, just wanna make sure I, I'm clear. It's just really important because, you know, I did, I spent time, I did about three years in prison and I, I was always interested in these men. Of course, I seen the artists and the sculptors who would do great work with soap and all these great visual artists who I saw. And of course, the book, the first book I read was an anthology in prison uh, called The Pen. I don't know if you were familiar with The Pen. It was an anthology of poetry written by the inmates. And I was always interested in staging this work and seeing what the social life of these inmates are in front of an audience. So it would be great to see, you know, what the audience feels and sees when they see this play as these men just kind of are with each other. Because it's not really about these heightened, uh, the, the carriage is already heightened, they're folklore heroes, but it's really about this family in prison sometimes that we don't get to see because we're not incarcerated with them. And these guys are locked up with each other every day. And that kind of socializing that happens amongst each other, although the tension is always high and the gas is on, they still have to socialize, so looking forward to sharing that art with you know, the audience. You know, if I may add, um, uh, incarceration is a state of mind sometimes because some people can be in the streets and be incarcerated in their own their own space. I remember one time, one kid, a uh, pretty talented dancer, um, came up to me. His name was Dancer. And he says, Lee, you're so lucky, you know. He just looked at me up and down, almost kind of like sizing me up. But, you know, we're, we're buddies from the hood. And he's like, you're so lucky. I was like, why am I so lucky? He says, you have everything. I'm like, you can start any time in your life. You're 40 years old. You can start your whole life all over right now. Um, just because you think I'm lucky because you don't see what I go through doesn't mean that, you know, it was all, you know, rosy from the beginning. Everything... Just because things are going right now doesn't mean that they were wrong before. Um, uh, I always felt I had in my heart that what I was painting about, the reason why I was painting, it was because I needed to 
uh, exercise the demons in me and actually express myself, you know, in an unorthodox way. But, you know, I worked hard and anyone can start to work hard at any time whenever they're ready, whenever their souls are taken out of that incarceration. start with um, questions. Hi, how you doing? Uh, good afternoon, all the panelists, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, my name is Sebastian. Uh, I guess my question, so I don't want to make it too complicated, but um, so the way I see it is that all of you gentlemen are part of hip hop culture, not to put anyone in a box, but you know, you contribute to the cultural and community capital um, and the various elements of hip hop. And you know, I'm I'm 24, college graduate, and I'm, I myself am hard pressed to like come across not hard pressed, but like to come across work like yours. And what I see is like almost like a one generation um, in front of me. So I'm thinking about like the youth, uh, and just um, just take it into the context of hip hop culture. I was wondering what um, you gentlemen think of hip hop culture nowadays and what because you know if someone like me who has all, who has like studied hip hop uh, gospel of hip hop KRS and stuff come across this i only imagine like the the teenagers who hardly know who Tupac is and things like that like what do you what do you all think of hip hop is there anything good in it these days is there stuff you'd like to see changed and also um, i'd like to know what work you do with youth and um, uh, more interestingly to me uh, if you could have your dream come true and have like your impact on youth be whatever you wanted it to be, what would that be? Um, I may start. Uh, actually, I've always, I've always uh, had a dream of having a, a center for the arts um, that would cater to kids, um, young people, kids um, of, all, of, all, of all sorts of um, the arts, from film to poetry to dance and painting. Um, only because when I was a kid in the 1970s, a young man, um, you know, all these, uh, all these uh, programs were totally slashed. And the city was in a fiscal crisis back then as well. So, um, I f and probably that's probably the key way that made me go into those yards at night um, to just like invent myself, reinvent myself if, the, if it wasn't you know, uh, reachable. Um, that's, that's, that would be my dream. And I think hip hop now is going through a transition, maybe an intermission, because there's a lot of emphasis on wealth instead of health of heart. And I think, um, you know, at the, end of the, the other, at the end of the day, any artist, visual or not, has to live with him or herself in their studio or in their mind with what they dish out and if you dish out junk food, you are the junk man. You are, the, and you have to live with that. You have to have, be conscious of that because you are leaving a legacy. You're leaving a footprint of a time now and after. So I think you know. You know, I I, I love all types of music. I listen to everything, and hip hop has been one of the things that I've been sort of like a little, you know, just scratching my head about. Um, it doesn't feel relevant to me at this point. And maybe it's too fast paced or something, and maybe I'm just like stagnant or whatever, but I just, uh, I feel that it lost, you know, and anything that gets into, into a, um, a consumable, you know, a thing, uh, when money gets involved, it's, you know, it starts to get tarnished and maybe lose a little bit of its edge and the innocence. And I saw it right from the beginning and way before the beginning, so I know. Um, and, uh, but I think that there's still a lot of good hearts that have a lot to say about their time. And I love the, I love the saying, I keep saying it, that every culture will create the art that it deserves. And, uh, I think that, um, we're just in that intermission now where people are taking a moment to reflect and maybe, uh, incubating, you know, the idea, percolating, you know, and then it'll just come out naturally when it's ready. A good idea is always good at any time, given time. <laughs> For me, hip hop, <clears throat> I was there during the beginning, back in 1975, when it really meant something to me. And it was called, drop. for us, it was called Drop in Science. 
we use a microphone as an opportunity to address the various issues that were going on with our community. And it really meant a lot to me at that point, you know, and, and I loved it a lot. Of course, you know, it's like finally we get, at least the where I came from in Brooklyn, you know, people were saying things that were really relevant. Actual facts, solar facts, dealing with health, nutrition, all that. And, um, you know, with crack, things changed. I mean, because prior to the crack epidemic with KRS and uh, um, Grandmaster Flash and, and so many others, you know, they were, they were saying things that were really addressing the issues at the time. And it was, it, you know, hip hop became a universal language. So the message, you know, transcend all over the, you know, race, color, and creed. And it was a real good thing. And then crack came. And then the language changed, you know. You know, a lot of the artists reflected what was going on in the community and their music. And it was very, it was very real, it was hard, it was painful, but it was real. And then it, things just changed. You know, and it's sad because, you know, the airwaves can give life and artists have the ability to bring about change. And it's just unfortunate that a lot of the artists are not using their voice to really affect that change. We feel now that, you know, we have to talk about niggas and bitches and hoes and getting money and, 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 and all that. You know, it's, it's been made fair seem and it's sad. You know, I miss the times in which we, we spoke about brotherly love and unity and togetherness. You know, and the bad thing about it now, hip hop, and once again, being this a universal language, you know, people are picking up some of the bad, the, the, the bad habits of it. I was in Sweden a few years ago, and uh, I had a, a young brother greet me, you know, what up, my nigga? And it really bothered me. And he, says he, and he seemed perplexed with my reaction. But I come from a time in which we call each other brother, you know, and I, I have a problem with that. And it's sad that, you know, and I, I've, I've been through a lot of battles. I mean, there's people who cut me off because I hate the word nigga, you know, and I'm not gonna ever accept it. You know, um, we have a responsibility and the time is very critical right now. And artists are given a gift, just like me, you know, having the ability to see is a divine gift that I've been given. And I feel with this gift, I have to use my, my ability to see to create positivity. And uh, I can create negative images, or I can create positive, but I feel let me create positive images that are thought provoking to make people think. So, you know, I don't want to pass judgment on anyone, but we live in a very critical time right now, and there's so many very necessary issues to talk about, and artists need to re-examine that. And I don't always blame the industry, because we've been made to believe that the record producers are telling you, you have to sing about niggas and bitches and hoes and all that. It's like, sometimes you got to go against the grain and say, yo, I'm not going for it. You know, but we're in a state of emergency right now, and I think that hip hop has the ability to really educate people all over the world. So if artists, you know, step forward and say, you know what, I'm not going for this no more. I'm gonna drop signs like it was back in the days, whatever. I'm gonna just do it. You know, it, it'll mean a lot to me. In terms of mentorship, you know, I've been mentoring young men since I was 15 years old. You know, the men who mentored me told me, we're gonna give you this knowledge, but you have a responsibility to give it to the next man. So every single day of my life, I strive to mentor people. Even if it's just on Facebook, posting a song, you know, wake up everybody, you know, ain't no stopping us now. I strive to use all the tools in front of me to mentor young people constantly. My phone is always ringing with young people who are at risk, you know, and they don't have, they can't go to a psychiatrist, so they call me up. So it means a lot to me. I'm teaching constantly. I'm on my way to Minneapolis tomorrow to teach a workshop in the spirit of Gordon Parks to a group of young people. I can't wait to go to go to the hood. I want to go right in the heart. Where the drugs at? Where the projects at? That's where I want to be. I want to talk to young people, so I do it every day. As long as I have breath within my lungs, I'm going to use my voice and vision to inspire the next generation. Um, do you all have, do you want to add something crucially? Because we have, I see yeah. there's, all of a sudden there's a huge line of questions. <laughs> Maybe we could uh, open it up. Unless you I have do. something. Yeah, you all are good? Fun. Okay, thank you. I'm a little short, so I'm going to grab the mic. Like, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a short Puerto Rican, what can I say? Hey. Um, hi guys, I just want to say thank you so much for your vulnerability and your genuineness in your art. Um, it really means a lot. I'm a type of person that really connects the most with people when they're very real. And I purposely only came to this session because for me, the only way I can really receive information is when it's from the heart. So I really, really appreciate, your, you were so moving to me when you cried, because to me, that speaks volumes of, that for you, your work comes from a place of un, a deep understanding. Um, so a little about me, my name is Denise. 
Um, I can know. we get to the question? Because we yep. have a lot of other yep. people behind you, I understand. Okay? Okay? I understand, but it's, Thank you, Denise. it's important, yes. important for me to share okay. this still. Well, so, yeah, just keep yeah. it real yeah. brief. Because we have other, I'm just saying, I we understand. only have five minutes. I okay? understand. Thank you. I'll ask later. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is a general question for the panel, picking back off the earlier question of hip hop, and I have one specifically for Mr. Quinones. Uh, Mr. Quinones, my first question is very basic. Um, I was struck by the art uh, that you dedicated to your sister, and also the um, golpe de suerte that you're putting together now. And I was just curious to know what was the significance for the samurai armor in the first piece, and then what is the mask doing in the second piece, Golpe de Suerte? And then for the hip hop, uh, for the, in terms of hip hop for the general panel, um, how much of this criticism of hip hop could be possibly a generational thing? Um, you know, uh, I know, for example, I mean, there is the question of the industry of hip hop. You know, which reflects the general music industry now, which is a very decadent one, materialistic, like Mr. Shabazz highlighted. But is it possible that we're missing something in the imagery and art that's being put out today? Um, I think of, for example, you know, not so much the, the murals in the streets, but like in Facebook, there's murals that people are doing with their, with their photos. And some people have been critical of that because they say it has gang insignias and this, that, and the other. And so I'm just curious to know if, if it's if, what you think of this current moment and if uh, in terms of the generational aspects of it. Um, well, very quickly, um, I mean, the samurai was uh, my indication of like the uh, a defiant figure that um, came from a powerful place and uh, but yet very fragile. Um, and the woman in his arms is more grounded uh, as she goes to the ground, so I thought that that was, you know, that that was what was going on. The mask is about just unmasking that untold, um, um, just those those taboo things that family is um, just don't share with each other in the living years, and that uh, it was re again revealing. So um, yeah, that, that's what I thought. Was the image appropriate for that? In terms of the general, the, 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 the generation gap, I think for me, knowing that there's a hundred million, there's a million black men incarcerated, it, it's a time of emergency, and we have to just use our voices to to address the time. And I think that a lot of people are not really taking what's going on really serious. You know, when we have that high incarceration rate, uh, you know, a, a lot of situations going on in our community, the, you know, constant killing. I think that we have to just address that. So, I mean, I am 53 years old. I'm from a different generation, but I understand the time, you know, very well. You know, I love hip hop. I was raised on it, but I just feel that, I mean, I come from a time of Marvin Gaye, Curtis Mayfield, the last poets and people, you know, you know, a lot of the artists back then, they were singing about love, but they were singing about unity. So it's kind of like it's a part of me right now and I miss that a lot. You know, but at the same time, a lot of these artists are showing me the reality of what's going on in the world. So I look at a lot of the music videos and I say, this is a reality. And this is a reality for a lot of people. So I, I'm very grateful for those artists that show me that reality so I can understand what's going on out here. I'm, I'm very empathetic and, and, and I'm, I don't want to ever be judgmental. But again, we are living in a time of, 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 of severe emergency. And, and these artists can make a difference. They have such power. And they can say things that can change everything. I mean, like I said, I catch hell for the word nigga, but if you have artists that stand up and say, you know what, I'm gonna put it out that we're not gonna use this word no more, and it could just stop overnight. And I, I really believe that. If the right artists stand up, they could change things easy, just like they have Rock the Vote, where you can get the hip hop generation to, to vote. You could sit back and have them you know, deal on another level right now, too. But again, I don't, I don't judge them, because like I said, they bring a reality to me that I do need to see. No, I just, I just want to make sure that if it's covered really well, that we have more opportunities for people to ask questions, and that was covered really well. So. Okay. okay. Good evening, all. Peace. I'm a 50-year-old black man, and formerly maybe? incarcerated, physically and mentally. The question that I have for you all is that it's once been said that it's easier to fix the babies, the young, than it is to fix a grown man. 
What have you done individually or collectively to help A, the babies, and two, these unfixable, unfixable black men? Because I was one of those unfixables. I stand before you whole. This is not pieces of a man. And I am from a time before crap. So, brothers, sisters. Let's start well, down on that end. Yeah. First, I'm a father of three daughters. And I'm, I'm extremely respectful of my relationship to women with my children. I don't yell at my girls because I want them to see that kind of respect that if one day they have a partner or they're in a relationship with a man, I want them to say, my father never spoke to me like that. That's the beginning uh, as far as how I was raised because my relationship with my parents was very different in, as far as communication went. And I got the high end, mira, que tu what I got, no, no, you know, all that. You know, I got that part. But I decided that's not the relationship I'm gonna have with my child. That's the first step with the babies, right? As a, as a man, who was incarcerated, every day is a struggle, man. It's a new day. Every day I deal with discrimination. There's certain schools I can't go to. There's certain schools I can't teach in because my history is very clear. I don't shy away from my past. I use my past in front of the public, right? That automatically puts me away from the Bible Belt in America, right? So I struggle with that every day. I struggle with an opportunity to teach other young men and women, uh, you know, that you can really do something, that you can really like wake up and live your dream. So they miss out, and those struggles are real to me, and I'm very sensitive to that. So you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that just every day is still, no matter as successful as I am, I still feel that pain because I care that much. So it's an ongoing process every single day. So that's my journey still to this day. You can see I have a documentary on Netflix called Lemon. You see it. I'm, I struggle in the arts trying to keep our voice in a place in, in the art world where it's not really supported. The theater nowadays, because I, you know, when you transcend to the New York Times, that changes a lot. So just wanted to share that as far as the answer. For me, um, that was a very great question that you uh, presented, brother. And um, I feel that as a soldier, I'm on a battlefield and, and there's so many people wounded. And I'm trying, I'm, I'm a medic holding down my position and everyone around me is just wounded, crying for help. And it's hard, you know, the old, the young, it's a very difficult thing. But at the same time, I'm out there trying to just inspire the young and the old, encourage them on. I see older brothers, I try to give them hope and promise because I know their pain and I understand what it is to be wounded because I'm wounded myself. But I try to stay in the fight and it's easy for me to give up and say I can't do this no more. But when I look at the great Harry Balafonte and I look at the fact that this man is 90 years old, still in the fight, still using his voice to address social issues, it gives me the inspiration to move forward. You know, so my life and my death is all about trying to uplift humanity. So as long as I have that life, I'm going to go out there and get the young and the old. You know, I'm focusing actually on the old because I need help to get the young. And I think that some of these old soldiers who've been wounded, you know, we need you. Just like yourself, you, you know, you were once pieces of a man and now you, you rebuilt yourself at 50. And we need you out there to talk to these young because a lot of them don't have fathers. They don't have mentors. So we need mentorship. So we need men who've gone through incarceration, who've gone through various trials and tribulations that can come and talk to young people because they will listen to them. If you're a 50-year-old man who's incarcerated, you, you can talk to a 15-year-old kid. So, you know, we all have to do our part right now, and it's the young and the old, and it's, 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 I have to. You know, again, it was given to me as a gift, knowledge, and I was told, just give back. So my life is all about giving back. Every single chance I get, I try to give back and offer encouragement. You know, because you don't know who the angels are. Because a homeless woman, wise homeless woman once told me when I walked by her, in my arrogance some 30 years ago. She said, what goes up must come down. And that humbled me. And you never know who the angels are amongst you. Mm. Can we just go to the next question? OK, thank you. Hi, um, so my question really dealt with um, 
the impact that mass incarceration has on the family. Um, I was wondering what type of art projects you are involved in or art projects you've heard of that really deal with this. Like I know of Pepon um, Osorio who did an amazing project um, that really talked about the relationships between men and their sons. So I was wondering if you had any other examples. And I also think it's really important that we know that there are millions of women that are also incarcerated. There are young boys growing up without mothers. There are daughters growing up um, without mothers. So um, yes, there are, a, there are millions of black and Latino men, but I mean, women are the, black women are the fastest growing prison population right now. So I, I do think that needs to be mentioned. Well, I'll, let me jump in so I can, um, so that was one of the things we were um, thinking about with this panel, but all our sister turned us down, who we asked, uh, they were busy, <laughs> which is great. Um, but I want to call your attention to the work of Latoya Ruby Frazier, if you don't know it. Yes. She's a photographer, and her work um, deals more with deindustrialization <clears throat> that we've talked about over this whole conference and how the destruction of neighborhoods and communities um, leads to uh, drug abuse, leads to homelessness, leads to crime. And so she really shows that in her work um, in the state of Pennsylvania and how her town, Braddock, is, uh, she shows the kind of destruction and, and particularly focusing on the hospital system there and how, um, you know, of course this is one of the centers where people have worked, uh, but, uh, you know, as it, you know, begins to close, as the town, you know, begins to lose its factories and so on, you know, how people are, are one, you know, connected to the hospital because of the health things with the different factories, but also, um, you know, how the, the institution of the, the hospital itself begins to be destroyed and how her family is a part of that. So that's, uh, you know, another great yeah, artist, I, uh, Latoya Ruby Frazier, who's working on that, who's also dealing with women. Um, but I thought I would, um, you know, if anybody else wants to answer that question, and then we can go on to the next question. I'll Thanks. just say there's a guy named Ari Khan okay. uh, who, who runs the post-education prison program in Washington, in the state of Washington. And what they have going on there is like no other program I've ever seen. They literally take people out of prison and give them full scholarships sponsored by Google. Wow. And it's incredible the rates of how they get people to graduate. They follow up, they give them work because they know they just can't go to school. You have to work after prison. And some of these are men and women, not just men. Most of them are women. They work for Ari Khan. He's a great, great man. He was incarcerated himself. And because of his incarceration, he felt like he needed to give back because he was such a, like, you know, he's really, really just smart guy, super, super program that works really, really well. It's called the Post-Education Prison Program in the state of Washington. And the recidivism rate is so low there, it's unreal. And because I'm, of him. And I'm sure you know about the Medea Project, Rodessa Jones, do you know? No, I don't. Uh, it's a really great program that uh, Rodessa Jones, who's a performer, um, has been doing with uh, incarcerated women for the past, I think, 15 years. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Brothers, it was truly a pleasure and a blessing to um, hear you guys speak this afternoon. Um, I'm truly honored to be here. And just a quick question for you all. One, if you guys could use all the attributes and skills that you all have to uh, create a team up there, how would you employ each other? Second, <laughs> if there was a, a physical space that ideally you could create to foster the hope and the possibility and the light in our community, what would that look like? Can I, can I ask you to answer those questions? Hey. Well, I can't answer the first one. I can answer the second one, yeah. You should be able to answer both. <laughs> the first one? Yeah, it was a good question. <laughs> no, I'm curious to know what you guys. Well, how curious. would you direct it? I, I feel, cause I how feel did like, I direct it? I feel like, I mean, for me, the first question is just kind of like, of the, of the five of us, I just be like, what do you want to do? <laughs> you know, but I'm really curious, because I think both of those questions require your insight, because, I mean, I think it, it's, it's you know, I'd probably be more interesting. Cool. No offense. I agree. That was well. Cool, cool, cool. 
Um, so to the first one, now I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't here for the very beginning. So I saw the last three. Um, photography, the video, and the poetry. Obviously, some kind of center for the arts where you have expositions that lead to conversations and deeper discussions on ourselves about who, you know, basically the questions that you were asking um, or that were asked in the video that you had up there, face to face, um, that are created from looking at um, Mr. Shabazz's photos or, you know, listening to your poetry and then having a discussion that further dissects the implications of that art and how that relates to us and how then we can take that and further create and further instill that in the youth and continue on that path of, I guess, really self-discovery, you know, and really learning ourselves because I think the thing that touched me the most about all of you up here is that you are very at least what you appear to be up on the stage, in touch with who you are. And I think that's something that, especially for black and brown men, is a huge issue. And if we don't know who we are, how can we help other people learn who they are? How can we go about existing in a world that really doesn't know how to classify us? So yeah, I, does that, is that okay? I think that's, that that's, a, your that's, a, that's a great <laughs> way that, we're going to end for our panel, and I want to thank everybody for coming out and thank Professor Roberts, Iris, Schomburg. Okay, enjoy the weekend.